Hi, um, my name is Hannes and welcome to the second talk for today for the .NET Days uh, Romania. I've been doing this thing with all the digital conferences where I've spoken uh, the last couple of years uh, where I try and find a landmark uh, of the city that I'm pretending to be in. So um, this is the Palace of Culture that, that you probably all, all know from Yash. And I hope that next time when uh, the next uh, .NET Taste Romania takes place, that I can be there with you and maybe drink uh, a glass of Tsuika with all, uh, with all of you. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, Aka.NET and how you can use it to build IoT systems. Um, now for a short schedule of what we're going to run through, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history about Aka.NET and where it came from. Um, then I'm going to briefly introduce to you what it is and how it works. Um, then I'm going to sketch the problem domain that we try to apply it in. And I'm going to explain how it fits into that. Um, and then if we have time, we probably will. Uh, I'll dive into a couple of implementation details and we'll wrap up with some things that you can do after this talk to get started for yourself. Now, the first thing that we have to worry about is why do we even have Aka.net? And if we dive back into the origins of the actor model, we can see that in the early 70s, uh, a couple of researchers started writing papers about designing software uh, the way that physics work in the real world by having objects interact with each other. And they did so uh, by, uh, by designing a theoretical model back in those days. And that theoretical model, um, they couldn't bring it into practice because it required lots of independent micro microprocessors and they simply didn't have them. But like a lot of things that we use today, um, it was designed back in those days. I think it's probably because those people were less distracted by their smartphones or they had better drugs than we did. I don't know, um, but it's it's definitely something to, to be set for. Now, the first time that we actually saw this brought into practice was in the 80s. And in the 80s, um, at a company called Ericsson, um, Ericsson was a company that was designing telco systems. And those telco systems, they made money for their operators um, for every telephone connection that they could make and for every minute that people could keep talking to each other. Um, so you can see that downtime in a situation like this um, is going to cost you lots of money. So they were looking at this actor model and they figured this could be a good way to write the software for our next telco system. And they did. But the, because they didn't have a programming language that allowed them to build such a paradigm, they actually invented one. And that language was Erlang. And with Erlang, they built the software for this telco system. And they made it very fault tolerant and completely distributed. And with a code base of over 2 million lines of code, they could reach an uptime of nine nines. And nine nines, to put that into perspective, that's about 31 milliseconds of downtime per year. Now, 31 milliseconds of downtime is amazing. And I have no hopes with any software system that I've ever built of even reaching that. So it's, it's beyond impressive. Now, fast forward a couple of decades. Um, we are happily coding in .NET and the year 2015 hits. And over the course of a couple of months, um, we actually get the release of three different actor systems. Microsoft releases Project Orleans in February, um, which is the actor system that they built to build the backend for Halo 4. And then Akka.net, which was a port from uh, Akka on the JVM that had been around for a couple of years at that point, um, was released in April. And in April, Microsoft also released these service fabric reliable actors. And you can debate whether those are true actors or not, but that's not really the point of this, of this slide. The question that we have to ask ourselves is why 2015? What is so important that this technology that we already saw in practice in the 80s 
in the telco system of, of Ericsson, why is it only brought to these mainstream programming languages in the in in the, the second in the, the second half of the last decade? Um, and the reason for this is actually pretty simple. If we look at the way that we scaled software up to then, you're, you're probably looking at scenarios like this. Uh, you were looking at some kind of load balancer and then a farm of servers that lived behind it. Um, and maybe a database cluster that handled all of the, the non-volatile um, memory that you needed. And then a cache cluster to manage all the volatile memory. And if you can manage that, and if you had something that was this type of scale, that was like a huge application. Because the, before that, a lot of the applications were used internally. Websites didn't get crazy amounts of load but from 2010 we had the explosion of the web and smartphones and the internet of things and basically the scaling scenarios that we're faced with today are completely different if your app gets featured on the app store you can go from a couple of thousand users to a couple of million users over the course of a day and then you need something where you can just adjust the slider and have a backend that scales with it and this linear scaling that we're hoping for is not really that easy to achieve in a scenario that looks like this. And if we look um, at this slide, um, our life gets even worse um, because this is um, data about more than 40 years of processor uh, statistics. Um, and we see a couple of things that are not really working to our advantage because up until a certain point, basically up until 2000, 2005, every time you're, you got more users on your application, you could basically buy a, a faster server the next year. Now, what we're seeing is clock frequency has already stabilized for more than a decade. I mean, when I was in college, we were overclocking to five gigahertz in uh, using liquid nitrogen. Um, you're not going to get that much further today. Um, so three gigahertz PCs are, are still a thing, and it's still the, the range that most uh, processors operate in. What we also see is that single thread performance um, is tapering off. It's still increasing, but not as much as it did before. Um, so we cannot count on the performance of a single thread to basically make our applications faster. So what we're actually going to do is to look at the one line in this graph that actually offers us any type of hope, and that is the number of cores. Because um, if we look at until 2005, it was very, very, very rare that a PC had more than one core. But now you probably have six or eight or even 12 cores in the pocket of your pants in your smartphone. So if we want to have any kind of salvation at solving the scaling problem that we are faced with, then this is the number that we're going to have to take advantage of. Now, the number of cores um, might be increasing, but if you've ever tried to write any type of multi-threaded code, you're going to know that this is tricky. Um, because the problem with parallelization is that at some point you're going to have state. And as long as you don't have state, there is no problem. But as soon as you have state that needs to be accessed from multiple threads, you're going to have something called race conditions. And as soon as you have race conditions, you're going to want to mitigate them. And if you want to mitigate them, that's when you're going to, going to introduce some, uh, some type of blocking. I mean, making sure that there's only one thread that can do something at the same time. So if you have blocking, that opens up the risk to having deadlocks, which is two threads waiting for each other. And inevitably, whatever you do, you're always going to end up with a little bit of serialized code, code that cannot run in parallel. And this is the stuff that hurts your scalability the most. And this is um, explained in Amdahl's law. Amdahl explains how much you can speed up uh, a system theoretically for a fixed workload by throwing more resources at it. 
And this it expresses this depending on how much of the code can be parallelized. And if we have 50% of the code that needs to run in series and 50% that can uh, be parallelized, it doesn't really matter how many cores we can throw at it, we can never speed it up by a factor of two because half of that code still needs to run in parallel, uh, in series. So if you look at this graph and you look at the green line, in which case we have 95% of our code that can be parallelized and only 5% of it that needs to, uh, to run in series, we're still never going to speed it up by more than a factor 20, even if we throw thousands and thousands of CPUs at it. So if we want to have something that linearly scales in a scenario where we're going to have to get a speed up of probably a hundred or a thousand or, or a 10,000 fold, then some numbers like 90 or 95% aren't going to cut it. We are going to need a system that allows us to parallelize almost all of our code. 99.9% .9 of our code needs to be run in parallel. And those are the promises that we're actually getting from these actor systems. These actor systems promise us that we can have very, very, very high degrees of parallelization for a stateful system. Um, and that's very important. And it does this by having reactive patterns. Um, and those reactive patterns also allow us to introduce uh, a very high degree of fault tolerance and self-healing. And I'll get to that in a couple of slides. So those are the promises that we're getting. Um, enough chit chat. I'm going to explain to you how ACA.net actually works and how it does these things. And the basic building block uh, for any actor system is, um, is an actor. And an actor is actually a simple .NET CLR object. Well, in our case, it's, it's a, a .NET object, but in um, ACA and the JVM, um, they're obviously Java objects. Um, but the, these objects, they have their own state. Um, and the state is just um, held inside the object as internal fields in the class. Nothing more, nothing less. And every actor has an inbox. And that inbox allows us to send messages to the actor. And these messages are the only input that an actor can take. These messages, they are processed in order and one message at a time. And this is the powerful thing. Because they are pro uh, processed one at a time, we have a guarantee that on this actor, there is only one threat manipulating its state. So it does away with all the um, requirements for locking uh, certain variables or certain resources. You know that you are the only threat running on this actor at any time. And that is extremely powerful. That allows us to write pretty simple code and it allows us to write code that is easy to reason about and we won't have any concurrency issues on the state in our system. Now, the simplest actor you can write looks a little bit like this. Um, you inherit from a class that comes from the ACA.NET framework. You implement an unreceive met uh, method, and the unreceive method is called whenever a message is dispatched to this actor. And now I can start doing something with the message that comes in. It's simple as that. Now, these messages are also something that we need to talk about. The messages are also simple objects. There's no need to inherit anything. Um, but it's very important, as with any messaging system, that you try and keep messages immutable. Now, ACA.NET does not enforce messages to be immutable. You don't have to do that. But, and in theory, you could exploit it. So you could send a message to another actor and then change the contents of the message while the other actor is processing the message. You could do that. As long as it doesn't cross a machine boundary, uh, the message doesn't get uh, serialized and deserialized. So you're actually passing around the, the object. Um, now, the problem is as soon as you cross a machine boundary, it gets serialized, deserialized. So the thing you're trying to exploit no longer works. So just don't do that. Um, try and keep your messages immutable. It's a very important thing. Now, the uh, Petabridge people claim that you can get 50 million messages per second on a single server. 
Um, on my laptop, I can easily get, well, I have a new laptop since I wrote these slides, so I can easily get around 4 million messages a second. So on a beefy server, I have no reason to doubt that you can get to those 50 million messages per second. And that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of throughput that you can get. Now, the overhead of um, having a single actor, um, the messages are, of course, they consume memory when you pass them around. The overhead of having an actor is around 400 bytes, so that's also not that bad. You can have millions of actors on a single machine. Now, how do you do these immutable messages? There's a couple of things that you have to think about. Of course, now in .NET, we have record types since .NET 5. Um, if you're using a little bit older version of .NET, make sure that your properties only have getters and set them in the constructors. And think about the arrays uh, or collection types that you are using. Um, there are uh, immutable collections that don't allow you to change the contents of um, the collection, and that way you can ensure that all of your messages do not change. Now there's one last piece to, to tie it all together. We've got these actors, we've got our messages, but then we need some kind of puppet master, and the puppet master is the actor system, right? And this is the kind of Metallica album that I grew up with. Um, I'm really that old. Um, but the, the thing is that this Puppet Master controls everything for us. Um, it controls actor life cycles. It actually creates the actor instances for us and it dispatches them um, as it disp uh, dispatches the messages to them. Um, it manages their inboxes. It does the thread scheduling for us. There is an event bus that we can use to do pops up messaging between actors that is managed by the actor system and so on and so on. Basically, it does all of the heavy lifting for us. And that allows us to write very, very simple actors ourselves and reason about the flow of our application and not about all the thread scheduling stuff that we need to get all that code into parallelism. Now, how do we create an actor system? Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you call actor system.create and you give your actor system a name, you already have one in memory. Um, it's easy as that. Now, if we want to create our actor, remember that actor that I showed you a couple of slides ago, if we want to actually create that actor, we're going to need something called props. Um, and props is something that you only uh, see in, in these kind of systems. It's basically a constructor pointer. It describes to the actor system how your uh, actor needs to be instantiated. Now, in this case, we are using the empty constructor, but you can pass constructor parameters. And this is the information that your actor system is going to use to actually create your actor for you. It will instantiate it for you. It will manage the life cycle. You will never actually have the object reference in hand. And when you call system.actor off, it creates a top level actor with the props that you just gave it. And you gave that you give that actor the name my actor name. Now what we're getting back is not the actual actor. We are getting back an i actor ref, and an i actor ref is a, is an object that allows us to talk to the actor that was just created. So it's basically a messaging gateway to the inbox of the actor. Um, that way nobody is able to actually change properties of the app, um, of the actor instance themselves. We're actually talking to them through these references. Using the tell method, we can actually send a message to that, in, uh, to that um, actor and that will actually enter into the actor and uh, be dispatched on a thread to be handled by it. Now that we know all that, um, we're going to have to talk about actor hierarchy. Um, what we just created was a top level actor. Um, actors can have children and your position in the tree is your address. So if you look at the actor on the bottom right, um, that one is slash user slash a2 slash b3. There are three actors that are always present in any actor system. You get them as soon as you start it up. It's the root, the user, and the system actor. 
Underneath the system actor, all the thread scheduling and event bus uh, stuff is running. And under the user actor, that is where um, the actors live that we are going to create when we're actually creating user space actors. Now, these, these uh, top level actors, you create them by creating them on the system. And then actors can create their own children and they can create children and children and so on. And why is it important that all of this lives in a hierarchy is to get back to the fault tolerant part of uh, our applications. Um, we can basically say that um, it works just like the real world. Um, I have three children. If any of you uh, have children, you will notice if you go to a supermarket with your kids, who is responsible, it is you. It is not the children. If somebody fucks up in the supermarket, it is your fault. Uh, it's your fault, and you're gonna have to solve it. And basically, with actors, it works just the same. If you have an uncaught exception in an actor, that exception gets escalated to the parent, and that is something called supervision. The parent is actually supervising the correct uh, behavior of their children. And you can take a couple of actions. Um, if the error is not too bad, you can say, okay, just pick the next message of your inbox and continue. Or you can tell the actor to stop. Um, basically, that eliminates the entire inbox and the actor instance. Um, or you can um, ask the actor to restart, which means that the actor system will recreate the actor with the same props that it was originally created with. Um, and it will try to dispatch the, the same message to the new actor instance. Um, doing this preserves the entire inbox. Now you can apply this strategy to either only the failing child or you can uh, apply it to all children. Let's say that you have a workload that you split into many, many different chunks and you dispatch them all to different actors. And one failing child means that your entire workload is invalidated. That's a moment that you might want to stop all of your child actors. Um, this is something that you implement by hand. There is a default behavior, which is the, the restart behavior to only the failing child, the one for one strategy. Um, but it's something that you're going to have to think of when you're uh, dealing with these failures. Now, the cool thing about this is, is that you can push that failure to the bottom of your tree and only have certain actors that are going to recycle while the rest of your system just stays up and running. And that is very, very powerful. And that's how these systems get these very, very high uptimes. Now, there's a lot of design patterns and ideas that you're going to have to think about uh, when you're building with actors, because you're going to reason about your code differently uh, than you do with an object-oriented system, for instance, when you're doing solid. So the general idea is that you're going to split any workload into very small chunks and then split that into even smaller chunks. And then you're going to make a separate actor for every one of those chunks to be processed on. All of the risk you're going to want to push down so that you're... Um, top level actors can survive and that you uh, can deal with supervision for, or with anything that fails and that crashes. And one thing to avoid are bottleneck actors. If you want this to scale to infinity or to near infinity, um, you're going to have to avoid that you have actors that are getting so many messages that they cannot process it on a single thread. Um, because that's basically the only bottleneck that you can really get. If you have an actor that gets more messages than a single core on your machine can process, that mailbox will overflow and it will actually become a bottleneck for your system. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can design against this. One of them are routing groups. You can have pools of actors that do the same thing and so on. Um, but I'm not really going to dive into all of those today. Um, know that the people from Petabridge, which is the company that supports Aka.net, um, has a whole course on design patterns. There's a whole bunch of design patterns that you can use for messaging. They're not all specific to actors. A lot of them apply to normal messaging systems as well. Um, 
but there is a whole course. Now, um, maybe quickly um, tell you who Petabridge is. Uh, the people who started porting um, Akka from the JVM to the .NET CLR, they, uh, um, they were Roger Johansson and, um, and Aaron Stannard. Now, Aaron has gone on to found a company called Petabridge that offers production support to Akka.net. Akka.net is free. You can uh, use it for free. It's open source. Um, but they offer a, a bunch of production tooling that you can purchase off them, uh, which is paid. Or they can consult with you if you're running into certain problems and they can help you out. I'm not affiliated with them, but I think that they're doing a great job in maintaining this whole thing and they offer some pretty cool courses. So look into that if you want to actually use that. Now, one of the patterns that, um, that also comes into the, plays into the whole supervision thing is one of the things that I wanted to uh, share with you. It's, uh, it's what they call the character actor. And it's something they do in Star Trek. In Star Trek, they often have guest actors that play along for one or two episodes. Um, and what happens is they arrive at a new planet. They send down this character actor to go and explore things. And if, inevitably, that person dies because it's a hostile environment, right? Um, now, what this does for the series is actually very interesting because that ensures that the main cast can survive. I mean, the, the main cast can survive the whole series um, while the character actor just dies. And this is something that we try and do in actors as well. If we know that we're going to do something risky, and risky means everything that can go over the network, everything that goes to disk, uh, th those are all risky operations um, that might fail. If we're going to do something risky, what we're going to do is we're going to create a child actor to actually do that risky operation for us. And then we will delegate that risky operation to the child actor. That means that our parent can deal with um, either the success or the failure of this operation. Um, but all of the parents' state, um, all of the all of the main cast of our episode can be preserved this way, and we basically build a sacrificial uh, child actor that we can use to uh, do our risky operations for us. If you want something to build something with high uptime, this is a pattern that you're going to be using constantly. Now, I'm not going to dive into all the other patterns. Um, I want to explain more about the problem that we were solving with this. Now, the way that the meters look in my house, and um, I just realized that this slide is outdated because my meters just got upgraded a couple of weeks ago to digital ones. Um, but this is what they used to look like. Uh, it's by, by gas, by electricity, and by water meter. And I was working for a company that um, was trying to um, provide insights on top of those meters. And we had software, we had the um, hardware devices that talked to the digital varieties of those meters, but we also had optical ones that we could just tape on top of those spinning dials and still get a reading out of those. Um, and then you had an IoT device in your house that would collect all that meter information and send it over the internet to our backend. And on top of that backend, we were offering uh, insights through a web portal and smartphone apps and so on. And to grossly simplify what we want with this data, I'm going to say that we want to store all of our historic energy and, uh, and water usage, and that we're going to want to plot graphs on top of that data so that we can compare time periods and so that we can have alerts uh, to alert us of any weird behavior in our consumption. Um, now, that alert, those alerts can be uh, momentarily or they can be periodic. Um, if we simplify it like that, the first thing that we're going to have to worry about is that we're not looking at um, consumption. The number that we see on those meters, it means the number of times that the dial has spun since that meter was produced at the factory. 
Now, usually that correlates to the amount of time that the meter has been installed in your house, which is not necessarily the amount of time that you've lived there. Um, but electricity companies, they also recycle these meters. So it's not even always true that that is the amount of electricity that was consumed in that house. Um, so that's tricky. And we don't actually care about the number. What we care about is about how much that number changes. Um, so that blue line is of very, very little interest to us. What we care about are the orange blocks. And that is how much our reading has changed. The reading on the meter, if it goes up by 20, that means that we consume 20 kilowatt hours, which is what we will get billed for. So that's the numbers that we actually care about. So the first thing that we're going to have to do in our pipeline is actually convert those numbers to something that we care about. And then the next thing is uh, the alerts that we're dealing with. The alerts can either be momentary alerts, which is really easy to see. Uh, if you have a bar that goes over 90, raise the alert. That is easy. Um, if you have an, a 20 minute alert, you can discuss um, about the green line, whether that should be an alert or not. The red line is pretty clear. I mean, we've crossed that line for 20 minutes straight. The green line, We've crossed it on average, but we haven't crossed, crossed it in all of the blocks. So that's a discussion that you're going to have to have with your product owners to see what we actually mean by certain types of alerts. We had both types, so that was fun. Um, but that, now that we have the concepts of this, this alerting and we have um, the concepts of reading and consumption, we can continue to what actually made ACA.net a good fit to do all of this. Now, the first thing that you um, do when you build your first IoT application is you're going to look at what kind of stuff does my favorite cloud provider offer that helps me build a backend. And if you look at, <coughs> if you look at uh, Microsoft's offering at the time that we were actually building this, they, they would show us uh, this kind of stuff. So for device communications, they would point to IoT Hub. Um, device communications is, is something tricky that you're going to have to do in every um, IoT uh, application. You're going to have to authenticate your devices against your backend. You're going to have to detect whether they're online or not. The devices have to be able to send events to your backend, and you're going to have to be able to use the backend to send control to your devices and that control can be turn on the light or set your uh, thermostat to a certain uh, set, set point and so on. Now, at the time that we started, which was before Azure IoT Hub existed, we built all of this ourselves. I would never do that again. Um, so IoT Hub is a perfectly viable solution to this problem. Um, it works on very, very low power devices. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, so it basically solves that problem. Now, as soon as data streams into your um, cloud solution, you're going to have to shape that data. I mean, the things that I just talked about, um, switching from meter readings to consumption, um, filtering out weird values. Um, you're going to maybe want to enrich the data with other data that you have. You're going to want to dump it in storage somewhere. I mean, data gets shaped quite a bit in these applications. And then on top of that, you're going to want to provide some kind of value to your users because just storing data never actually made anybody rich. So we want a product that users actually want to pay for. Um, so we're going to run a couple of app services on top of our um, data. We're going to trigger some alerts. We can use, um, for instance, the Azure Notification Hub for that. Uh, we're going to want some dashboards, some analytics, and so on. There are so many things that we can use. Now, <clears throat> looking at all of this um, and having a team that wasn't really cloud savvy, we were thinking, was like, how can we maybe... Um, take some of these parts and make them simpler and do a lot of this into one product. And then basically we saw that everything that was data shaping, data enrichment, generating alerts, um, shaping data for dashboarding and analytics and so on, that that is the parts that we could basically do with an ACA.NET cluster. So that's how we looked at this solution. 
Um, now, doing this with Aka.net was um, a really good fit. Um, it couldn't be the whole solution. So we still had our um, our version of IoT Hub in front of it to talk to the devices. We had some storage services around it, and not all of the dashboards were actually built inside Aka.net. We actually built those outside of it. Um, so it's a part of the solution. It's never the whole thing. So oversimplifying a little bit what our backend looked like, we had the web portal that talked to the Aka.net cluster. Um, and then we had an IoT hub that connected to all of the devices um, that allowed us to um, stream all of the events through an app service to our Aka.net cluster. And for storage, we had a mixture of blob storage and relational databases, um, and that stored all of the data in there. Now, this is not really that important. The only thing that I'm going to come back to later is why that app service is there between the IoT Hub and the Aka.net cluster. And I'll see that in the implementation details later. Now, ac actors are a really good fit for a whole bunch of um, software systems, but it's not always a good fit. And if there's one thing that I'm really allergic to in uh, my years as a developer, it's that teams tend to choose technologies that are shiny at the moment. That's why the magpie is in the slide. It's the bird that is rumored to steal all the shiny things. Um, magpie development is a term that I've heard used. It's not something I invented. Um, it's a term that is used for developers who choose technology for the simple purpose of putting it on their resume and not because it actually makes their life easier with the application that they're building. Um, so if you apply that to actor systems, they are a really good fit for gaming backends, for any high throughput stateful systems like stock trading or Internet of Things or uh, stuff where we need to parallelize a lot of business rules and, and calculations. Um, but it's almost never going to be your entire solution. Um, so use it wisely and see if it makes your life easier before you actually start diving into it. Now let's dive into a couple of technical things. Um, we still have about 20 minutes, so that's okay. I should be able to uh, get through most of them. There's a whole bunch of things that you're going to run into when you start doing this. Um, and I hope to uh, highlight a couple of them. So um, the first thing that you're probably going to run into when you have a system like ours is that you're going to have to normalize measurements at some point. Um, now, normalizing measurements is a very important thing. Um, when we got data from our IoT devices that were in the field, um, we never got the data in a shape that we actually wanted to use it in our, in our backend. Um, some of the devices had as little as 8 kilobytes of RAM. I'm not saying 8 megabytes. I'm saying 8 kilobytes. Um, that number is correct. It was about as much as we could construct a single HTTP request and do it from that device and then hold a little bit of memory. Um, so those were the kind of devices that we were sometimes dealing with. Those devices did not have real-time clocks. They So they had things like clock drift where the time that they were reporting would actually shift and not be exactly a minute apart. Um, so things like getting our our timestamps to be exact, uh, making sure that we had no gaps in the data, um, filter out any incorrect values. Um, some of these digital meters, they had a serial port that would report all of the meter readings, except the serial port didn't have error correction. So if you got a flipped bit somewhere in the middle of um, a meter reading, that would actually cause like a huge spike or a huge dip in the graphs. Um, all of this stuff happened, and it happened more often than we liked. Um, and in the best case scenario, we would get actually data that looked like the data here on the left. Um, but usually those timestamps were drifting. We would actually get some data that was missing. Internet drops out for users. Um, 
devices get unplugged from electricity, get unplugged from the network, at some point you're going to be missing data. And all of this, um, yeah, made sure that it was really hard for us to write business logic. Now, what we tried to achieve was to have data like the data that we had on the right, um, where every reading uh, and every consumption that we had was exactly on the five minute mark, that there were no missing ones. Um, that was the ideal data for us to write business logic against. And we decided to do all of that in one place. Now, what you're going to get are these incorrect timestamps. You're going to get clock drift. So we want to get there and we want to look like this. Now, the tricky part is gap filling. Um, the developer in me says, OK, we're missing a couple of blue dots here. What are we going to do? We know the blue dot before it and the blue dot after it. So we can basically draw a line between those two, which is easy. Um, but the question is, is that still representative for a longer period of time? If we're missing 15 minutes, that's usually fine. If we're missing a couple of days, that's usually a big disaster because a flat graph for two days is going to trigger a lot of your alerts because nobody consumes electricity all the time every day. So you're going to get alerts that say that maybe you left the lights on or whatever. Um, so if we're going to fill this, there is no right answer. And especially for short periods of time, it's already bad. So we can say that we're not going to fill it, but then the sum of all the orange bars will not match our electricity bill. So users don't generally like that. We can put it in as a peak at the end, but that will trigger uh, a momentary alert descriptions um, or at the start or in the middle. The problem is the same everywhere. We can split it evenly, um, which looks pretty nice and flat, but it's also not a really good representation of the truth, especially if you miss data for a long time. And you can try and make a trend line. We ended up looking at the same time period the week before um, and using that data as a reference to make sure that we had the same trend line as that time. That was the closest that we could get to reality, but that is still wrong. Um, so what we did in the end is that we also um, flagged all of our gap filled data, uh, telling all the downstream actors that this data had been gap filled so that alert conditions were not raised on gap filled data, um, which was a very important part of, of getting the alerts correct in a scenario where we're actually guessing what the data was. Now, how we do that with actors is actually um, pretty simple. If we have um, a, an actor for every device, which is the actor, I hope you see my mouse arrow, which is the actor that lives uh, here in the middle of our graph. If something of, if the unclean data, the purple error, arrow comes in, what we're going to do is we're going to make a single actor, a single child actor, um, the value normalization actor that is going to filter out all that stuff. It's going to fill the gaps. It's going to take away the peaks. It's going to make sure that the timestamps are correct and so on. And to do that, and this was one of the reasons that we chose an actor system, the, the, the reason that we wanted to have a stateful system um, is that with every message that comes in from the backend, you're also going to, uh, from the device, you're actually going to need the previous message as well, because you can only do those interpolations in timestamps and those interpolations in meter readings if you have the previous message and if you know how much the number has changed. And because we're keeping data in memory, instead of querying the database, like what was the last um, value that we had? Okay, how much difference did we get? Okay, now we're going to write the next value to the database. That would be a very, very um, disk intensive way of doing this type of processing. And in our main operation, this was actually a lot of what, of, what our system was doing. 
So on the ingress side, this actually helped a lot because all of our value, uh, all of our normalization and all of our processing could be done in memory. And it took a little bit of management and it took a little bit of time to manage how much uh, data we would actually have in memory. Um, but because we could normalize it in memory, that, that made um, an actor system a really good fit for what we were doing. Now, if the value normalization actor is done and it has its message it, messages, it will actually communicate them back to its parent. And from there on, they can be sent on, and that's the teal arrow here, to all of the downstream actors that actually need this data. So if we do that, um, that was this story. Um, that helps us a lot in, in making sure that we never have to worry about gaps, if never about timestamps, about peaks, and so on. Now, if we're getting messages to our actor system, and I'm, I told you that I was going to come back to that app service that lived there um, between the IoT hub and our cluster. Um, one of the tricky things is um, controlling your ingress stream. Um, now, there is something that makes this all a lot easier. Actor systems can talk to other actor systems over TCP or other protocols, and they have something called, uh, it, it uses a package called Aka.Remote. And Aka.Remote is really powerful because it allows you to talk to an actor that lives in another, in another actor system. You're going to have to name the actor system at the address that the actor system lives on. You're going to need the path of the actor and the protocol that you're going to use to that. And that all together, that makes an actor path. Now, the cool thing about this is that this has location transparency. If you pass around an I actor ref, remember that one of the first slides that we did about actors is if we create an actor, we always get the actor ref back the actor ref that allows us to talk to the actor. If we pass that around through the network, that actor ref actually keeps working. So you can pass it to another node in the system and then use that object to actually, after it has been serialized and deserialized, to do a dot tell on that object and it will actually talk to the original actor that it points to. And that is extremely powerful. And that allows us to build systems that talk to each other. So the pattern that we used was something like this. Inside that app service, and the app service is the, the, um, is the one that lives on the left here, um, the app service actually has a small client actor system in it. And that client actor system we used only to host all the proxies to talk to the actual device actors. Now, what happened if we got messages from our IoT hub is if we didn't have a proxy for a certain device yet, for a certain device ID, we would create a proxy. And that proxy would actually message the device manager in our main actor system on the right by sending a connect device message. And if that device manager doesn't have a child actor for the device yet, it would actually create a device actor. Now, if the device actor was created, it would actually message the I actor ref back um, to the proxy. Now, the cool thing is because of location transparency, that proxy can now use that to relay all of the messages from the IoT Hub uh, event stream because IoT Hub has um, basically an event hub built in. Um, and all of those messages get relayed through that proxy actor. And the cool thing is that the proxy can now directly talk to the device actor on the right side. And that way we can avoid any of these actors uh, from becoming bottleneck actors because all of the devices are talking to the, the, to the correct actor directly. And we don't have a bottleneck that has to handle the entire stream. Only the connect messages are handled in the beginning. Um, but that is just plain simple uh, system startup and it doesn't really take that long to do. So what does that look like in code? I'm gonna uh, skip through this um, a little bit faster because I'm, I'm seeing that we're approaching three o'clock. Um, well, three o'clock my time, four o'clock your time in Ro Romania. Um, but what you see here is that we have something called the pre-start 
um, pre-start is handled um, before the actor takes its first message. So when the first mess before the first message is handled on an actor in start uh, instance, the pre-start is executed, and then we can use that to do an actor selection based on the remote address for our device manager. But actor selections are slower than actor references. But we can still use an actor selection to do um, to do a tell on an actor that we ha don't have an actor ref for, which is very uh, convenient. Also, one of the things that we're seeing is if we get the uh, device connected back, we're actually going to store the actual I actor ref which you can see here at the top right, the I actor ref for the device actor, we're gonna store it in our proxy. Now you can see one more thing in the proxy, we're not using an untyped actor anymore, we're using a receive actor. Receive actors are the strongly typed versions uh, of the actor base class, uh, which allows us to register receive methods for any type of message that's gonna come, on, come in. If you're building more complex actors, um, this is the way to go because you can register a handler for every type of message that's going to come in and it's going to keep your codes nice and clean. And as soon as we have our iActorF, we can use that to, to send messages to the other side of the system. And as you see, we don't have to worry about anything because of location transparency in the iActorF. We can talk to an actor that lives in another actor system. And this is something I do with uh, a lot of my actors is to make sure that I have a single place where all of the props for this type of actor are created. Uh, I make a static create props method that maps completely to the constructor of the actor. You can see the constructor up here and it takes a device ID because if this params array of the props.create parameter doesn't magically map to um, our constructor, that's actually going to be a bit of a pain in the ass because um, it will crash at runtime. So to make refactoring easier, I always make create props references. It's, yeah, my way of doing that. Um, the device manager that lives on the other side, it basically has to be able to, um, to check if the device actor has already been created. And if we create it, we have to make sure that they have a unique name. Um, your address in the actor hierarchy has to be unique, which means that if you have a manager that has a lot of the same type of actors um, below it, um, they're all going to need unique names. And you can easily do that by having the ID in there. If you want to create a child actor, you do that by doing context.actor off instead of system.actor off. System was for the top level actors. The context is to create a child actor. And then this is something that's really nifty. If you want to reply to the person who sent you the message that you're currently processing, you always have a property that is called sender and that you can use to reply to the actor that actually sent you the request that you're um, dealing with. So that's how we get messages across with these proxies. We're using location transparency. We're replying to sender uh, senders. Um, that's really nifty. Um, I'm going to do one more thing, but I'm going to do it really briefly and I'm going to wrap up. Um, the first thing um, that you want to know about is we've been talking about all of these actors and all of the memory that we've used was in memory, right? So if we turn off the system and turn it back on again, uh, all of our data is going to be lost. Now, if you want to uh, have actors that actually recreate their state when, when the actors are recreated, you're going to have to use um, persistent actors. And persistent actors are really interesting. They're a little bit of an event source system inside an, of an actor that allow you to persist all of the uh, events that have actually mutated your state, it, they, it, all, it allows you to also save your snapshots. And when that actor is recreated, um, it actually recovers all of its state from, um, from the underlying data store. It could be a, a relational database, could be a MongoDB, can be a lot of things. Um, so what does that look like? You inherit from the persistent actor and your actor is going to need a unique persistence ID. 
Um, that is the key that it uses to query snapshots, to query events, and all of that stuff. I always group state into a state object because it makes snapshotting a whole lot easier. Um, and now suddenly you don't see a receive method anymore, but you see a command and a recover method. And there are two types of um, thing, two types of messages that come in to this type of actor. First of all, a command is something that comes from the inbox, and a recover is an event that comes from persistence when the actor is recreated. So what will happen when this actor is recreated from its props is it will query the snapshot store for the last snapshot that will get reinstated. Then it will replay all the events that have happened since the snapshot. Those will come in through your recover method. Notice that I call it handle message internal. Um, and then it will start taking messages from the inbox. Um, there's a couple of commands that we can do stuff with for the snapshots. Uh, one of the things is um, the, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm seeing some Zoom window pop up here, so I'm going to move that a little bit, no worries. Um, and now I lost my PowerPoint, that's okay, we're back. Um, you can also deal because snapshots are saved out of process, so they are not synchronous, synchronously saved. So if you want to uh, check whether the snapshot has been saved successfully or if the snapshot failed, you register for those um, success and failure commands. Um, persisting messages happens really easily. Um, you persist, you give it the event that you want to save, and you also give it the method that needs to be called to mutate your state. And then this method will actually mutate the state for us. Now, that is the one that we're going to call directly uh, on a recovery, because that makes sure that we're not saving it to our persistence again and again and again, because then we will get into a loop. Um, and your uh, snapshots at, are at your disposal. I did it every 100 messages here, but you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can basically even schedule a snapshot on your actor if you want to. If you get a snapshot offer back when the actor is recreated, all you have to do is get your state out of the, um, out of the snapshot. And that's why I use state objects. Uh, it makes it so much easier if there's only one object that I need to reinstate on the actor. Now, what we need to worry about is when we use these persistent actors is that they will recreate all of their state. So you're gonna need to truncate that state somehow because after they restart, all of the state will be in memory. So at some point, you're going to have to build a hierarchy of actors that manages cold state and hot state. And the hot state is the state that you're uh, going to want to keep in your persistent actor. And that's the state that you're going to want to recreate when the application restarts. There's also going to be cold state, state that is written away safely somewhere, but that you can query when you need it but it is not always recreated because memory management will become an issue. If you have millions and millions of actors, you're gonna have to think about what, what memory, um, what data does belong in memory and what doesn't. And the way that we did it is we had a value storage actor under our device actor that took in all of our normalized meter readings. And that one basically held a working set for I think two days of data. Um, all of the older data got offloaded. Um, so that was actually persisted with the ACA.NET persistence um, system. Underneath of it, we had um, a historic that was our cold storage actor and the older values than the working set were actually written to a database, but they were not recovered when it restarted. And that allowed us to do something like uh, when we were recreating all of our child actors, we only had that one actor that had to recover its state from the database and all the others could query that one for it. I'm not going to do all those details. So we've talked about a lot of things and there's still so many more things to talk about. Um, if you wanna go and do this in production, you're gonna need to configure your ACA.NET processes. Um, for that, we use a um, language called Hocon. It looks like JSON, it's not JSON. Um, it stands for 
human optimized configuration object notation. It's something that they got from the JVM ACA. Um, how to manage a cluster across multiple processes, across multiple machines. Uh, that is something that I didn't really dive into, but that's also a complex matter uh, all in itself. You're going to want some kind of logging. Um, you can use dependency injection. It is a little bit of an anti-pattern with actors, so don't do that um, unless you have a really, really high need to do it. Um, and then if you want to monitor a big system, you're going to want to use Phobos probably, uh, which is the paid product that I talked about earlier made by Petabridge that allows you to monitor the size of your inboxes. It allows you to monitor uh, the size of all your uh, size. Um, how many actors you have, how much memory you're consuming, and so on. It's very useful if you're re running a big cluster uh, with Akka.net. If you want to learn more, um, there's a free Akka.net bootcamp on, uh, made by Petabridge on GitHub. It is very good. Um, I recommend that you check it out. Um, there is some stuff on plural sites uh, or other resources. The Petabridge blog is a gold mine. They blog about every feature, every new thing that they come out with. Um, if you need um, a simple explanation of how a certain feature works, you're probably going to find it there. Um, and you can follow uh, Petabridge remote training. That training is paid, but it's really worth it if you're uh, if you have any serious questions because you actually get taught by the people who are actually building Aka.net, which means that if they don't have the answers, nobody does. And one more thing that you're going to have to think about is when you deploy your systems. Um, it's always tricky when you do a scenario like this and the first thing you're going to have to do is pause the event stream and that's also why we had um why we had that app service so that we had something that we can pause the input to our actor system you're going to need to wait for all the processing to end then redeploy your cluster recreate all your actors and that will trigger all the persistence stuff to do its work to recreate state and then we can resume the stream. And if you do this correctly, you're not going to lose any data. But it's tricky, so I'd suggest that you automate stuff like this. Now, my conclusions for today is first check if, you, if your problem domain is actually a fit for actors. Decide which part of your solution you can actually do with Akka.net. You have to design your actor hierarchies appropriately so that you have the... Um, best recoverability from from faults but also make sure that you don't have any bottleneck actors normally normalizing data is going to help you so much when you're reasoning about systems like this one and think about how you do your deployment and your recycles because that's a whole tricky situation all by itself now there's one more thing i want to say is if you want to actually build a system very much like the one that i just discussed I'm going to do that the next two days. We start tomorrow morning on uh, this conference. Um, there's still a couple of places left. So if you want to join, um, feel free to sign up. We're actually going to do most of what I described here in code. And it's going to be so much fun. Um, my name is Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development at a company called Access in Belgium. Um, that's my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I'm on a mission to try and make ICQ great again. You can find um, a code base that does a lot of these things on GitHub. Um, so if you want to check out the code, um, you're free to do so. You can find it right there.